Today, we continue the conversation with a legendary couple. I don't use that title lightly, as the Stockwells have won more Olympic medals between them and have been in service to their community in such abundant ways over these past 30 years. It truly is legendary. Tracy is considered one of the greatest female swimmers in history, winning three gold medals for the US in swimming in 1984 and holding five world records. Only her countryman Phelps would come along to surpass her dominance in the pool. And then there's Mark, busy winning his own Olympic silver medals for Australia at the 84 games, while concurrently studying engineering, commerce, and later economics. Just a light load. So now heading up the very successful development, residential property and funds management group Stockwells, he spends his days in risk management, acquisition, and identifying new areas of investment. And as Tracy looks at him, we wonder, does he do any of these things? We don't know. But he's <laughs> constantly serving on boards, such as the Commonwealth Games, the Chair of Trade and Investment Queensland, past president of the Property Council, and even current Tokyo 2020 Australia Olympic Team Appeal Committee Chairman. By the way, I didn't even do half of these two justice, but we'll be in intro all day. So this man, like, does he sleep? That's the question. <laughs> Hailing from Nashville, Tennessee, Tracy made the voyage across to Australia post-swimming and has been awarded the Medal of the Order of Australia for her service to sport in this country and in particular opportunities for women in sport. But here's the kicker. They have five kids. I could have started and ended this legendary intro just with that part. So I truly appreciate you both for carving out a slice. Like I know Mark had to down the food really quick tonight but to share who you both are as a power couple and the family that you've created for us, it's a real honor. So thank you. Thanks. Sarah. Thanks, Sarah. I know that's your life. Oh, that's it. Yeah. That's just what we do. And you're like, what? <laughs> Never done. Um, yeah. Well, this is a question for both of you. And there's so many things I want to learn from you both and your life experiences up until now, but I do have a burning question and it kind of drove why I wanted to interview you both. So, have you ever been competitive with each other, considering Tracy has gold medals and Mark has silver ones? Ah. <laughs> I had to start like that. I just need to know. <laughs> well, Tracy does remind me sometimes of, uh, about that. But look, not really. I mean, I, I wouldn't think we're competitive with each other. Um, you know, I, um, we just give each other our own space and it seems to work pretty well. And, you know, I'm just in awe of her. So uh, that works quite well. But I do think, you know, when a card game or board game comes along, we're pretty competitive with whoever we're playing against. Um, but I'm pretty, that's, that's, I'm pretty actually, that's relaxed. A good point. I'm pretty no, relaxed. We, we, we're not good playing on the same team. If mm -hmm. we're playing Pinochle or 500, we, it doesn't actually we go that well. We have to play against We've each got to other. play against each other. Yeah. Is Tracy the silent assassin? I don't know. She just reminds me. Is she that? Yes, she yes, is, yes. right? Yeah, yeah. She'll sneak up on you. You like, got no idea. <laughs> yeah, I'm sort of getting that vibe. So I, I am pretty curious. I know athletes run into each other, even, you know, when you're from different countries and you're competing in the same sport. But how did you guys actually come together as a couple and better yet remain as a couple for so many years? So how does this happen? What's the story? Well, I, I mean, Tracy was a world superstar and I was aspiring. I didn't, I came to swimming quite late. Oh, okay. So my road to the Olympics was very sort of quick and um, towards the end of my twenties, uh, end of my teens and early twenties. And so I saw Tracy at a meet um, in 1983 at the 17 meet and she was standing on the dais and this funny little girl with all these trophies and cups and winning the swimmer of the meet and all those sorts of things. So I was always reading about Tracy in, you know, in swimming magazines and those sorts of things. And then we met um, at the Olympics and we met in the main street of the Olympic village. And I still remember it to this day. And um, I was at the time probably a bit more interested in Tracy's roommate than I was in Tracy. Chasing my roommate. But, no, you had my heart and then you just uh, crushed it right there, Mark. But then we, I remember um, we were well into the meet we were both swimming well. <clears throat> and I remember it was, you know, that sort of beautiful Southern California, you know, warm days. And I, and Tracy was on the kickboard swimming up and down. There was not many people in the warm up pool. And I thought, oh, I'll have a, I'll, I'll have a go here. Grab my kickboard, you know, I went, came up next to her and started talking. 
and um, you know she fell in love straight away. Oh. Obviously. <laughs> No, I thought I was trying to focus on my swimming. No, but I thought, oh, he's cute. And we had a lot of mutual friends. But then after the Olympics, Mark came to the University of Florida where I was finishing up um, uni and I wasn't swimming anymore, but he was on a swimming scholarship and that's where we fell in love. So Tracy was on my recruiting trip and she did a very good job <laughs> recruiting me. And then I went back. Um, it was between Florida and Stanford. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I wanted to win one of those big, rings, you know, those big NC2A rings, and Florida had won the previous two years. Uh -huh. And we got second. And I thought, no, no, if I go to Florida, they'll do a three-peat and I'll get my ring. Anyway, so that year, Stanford won and Florida got second. But I got the girl. So there you and go. And you got a different kind of ring, <laughs> wedding ring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I like this. Later. Yeah, we, we went out then for about seven years before we got married. And... Um, back and forth yeah that was a pretty interesting made a big effort journey. to you know and we always just made this effort to see each other even though we lived across the globe and um, I worked at Expo in 88 in Brisbane to see if I could still live in the same town and like him and that went well and um, yeah we I went and lived in Nashville for a while and yeah. um, as well in the late 80s yeah so I think you can make it work and we tell our kids that was before Skype and FaceTime and mm. you know emails and you know this is letter writing and tele Air Air telegrams and <laughs> stuff yes and expensive phone calls yeah. yeah so in courting her Mark did you find you know because you said you'd known about her did you find there was anything that you had to overcome to just see her for who she was, meaning because there was a lot of maybe news about her or stories about her, like, did that just come naturally? And you obviously had the gusto at the Olympics to jump in the pool next to her while you should have been focused. Clearly you were very focused. Um, but yeah, did you ever have to overcome any of that kind of awe stuff or was that always just easy once you got well, to know her? And to some extent, I still am a little bit, you know, I still look at her and at her and when she's not looking at me and I'll go, Wow, you know, what, what is she doing here? So <laughs> how did I get here? I still oh. I still feel that. But I think um, for me, I was obviously comfortable in my own skin. And I, I from that point of view, I think that helped me um, deal with Tracy's you know, just dominance and success. And then I think the other big thing was my mother and I had four sisters and I was surrounded by quite strong and powerful women. And I didn't realise it at the time, but now looking back, I go, oh, that's why I could handle all that. And mm. so being one of six, you know, and four sisters. And um, so I put it down to my mother, probably. And, you know, she was very strong um, herself. So mm. I felt quite comfortable um, in, you know, giving it to Tracy if she bloody uh, wanted to say <laughs> something that I didn't agree with or what, what have you. So, and I think there was that mutual respect and friendship um, yeah. first you know and that was um that was that's probably the foundation of it all and I'm, I'm glad you identified that you know at the time you may not have realized but I have three brothers and I remember a story of them playing basketball and getting in trouble one day for pushing a girl and they they showed up to the office to get their beating down or whatever was happening and because I was such a strong presence and my mom was in their lives they never thought of not doing that. It was actually a sign of respect to, <laughs> yeah. to just have her be like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And because I was quite tough, they didn't understand that there was supposed to be a difference. And so, yeah, you, you're, our families are really integral in how we treat gender, to be honest. I think one of the other things probably was um, after the Olympics in 84, Tracy retired straight away. That was the last time she swam. Mm -hmm. Um, in fact, I think she's only swum about five times since then. <laughs> but um, so I think from Tracy's point of view, she was nothing but supportive of my mm. swimming still. And she totally got it and understood and was very patient with all of that because I had to, still had to get, because I was so new to the sport, she'd been on the international scene for a decade, just about. And I was just sort of had arrived. And so I, I needed to go through all of that, which she was very patient. Yeah, got it. Okay, so Tracy, talk us through, you know, what age did you start swimming in Nashville? And was it always clear to you that you wanted to win Olympic gold medals? Was this something you dreamt about as a young girl? I did. I did. And a bit unlike Mark, who got into the sport much later, um, 
my older brother and sister encouraged me to join the swim team and because they needed one more little girl to fill up the relay team. So I did that, but I didn't love it at the beginning. I was very thin, very skinny. It was cold early in the morning um, and I didn't really love it at first. Um, but probably when I was nine years old, I remember watching the 72 Olympics on TV mm -hmm. and watching Shane Gould win her gold medals and um, and Mark Spitz win seven gold medals. And while I had, I've been swimming for about a year, I kind of thought, oh, that would be cool, you know, to go to the Olympics. I didn't know how you got to the Olympics or anything, but it did kind of become a bit of a dream of mine. And then in Nashville, we fortunately worked very hard to, co um, to have really good coaches mm -hmm. and who opened up our eyes to the opportunities that, that were um, in front of us. And then I've soon found swimming was something I really um, was good at. My sister would say, I'm a klutz on land. So the water was kind to me and I felt mm -hmm. at home in the water. And uh, once I, um, you know, got, got into it a little bit more and I found, hey, I'm pretty good at this. You know, maybe I could go to the Olympics one day and just really worked hard to realize that dream. Um, I was on my way to going to the 1980 Olympics, but then the US boycotted those Olympics. Um, and while that was really disappointing, and, at the, and now I guess I can understand what some of the athletes are going through now about the postponement. Hopefully it'll go ahead next year, but um, I know what they're, fe the, what they're feeling of that lost opportunity and that you know, kind of distraction um, and the timing of it all, but um, finally, but in hindsight, I was lucky that I was young enough and went in 84 and you know, met the big guy, so. Yeah, the big guy. So with all that winning over the years, and it was funny, Mark just dropped in this, the joke about you not swimming very much since. How do you feel that, you know, record breaking and winning, like how does it weave into your life today and we'll talk a bit more later about parenting and things like that, but how does it show up today in your life? Oh, I don't know. I don't know if it does too much. No, um, it does. I see it. And, <laughs> and, and, Tell me, Mark, what do we see? Uh, what do we well, see? Um, oh, I just, I just see her determination when she's, even though she gets frustrated with things, but she uh, does it to the best of her ability and she wants to be good at it and she doesn't want to let anyone down and, you know, she's very professional and always very well prepared. Um, so from that point of view, and even in being a mother, you know, I see it. And, you know, it's, um, and as the kids have got older now, it's it's probably that aspect is hard for them because she has been such a great mother. And, and so, you know, I, I, I've seen it in, in that. And I think, um, you know, the other thing is, you know, we're probably, we both really want to have, be good at marriage you know and i think mm -hmm. that's something that we both aspire well we work to. hard at it you know it is hard work and i mean we do <laughs> I, think I think in my good. world that's that's like hearing that is the best thing i've ever heard that's why i wanted to interview you together uh, yeah, because i know I think, yeah. yeah there's all the accolades but what you guys represent it's the hardest job on earth and i think you demonstrate that most important yeah it is the most important yeah. right mm -hmm. and you know i've always thought you know it now um, marriage, the best thing I can do for our children is to love their mother, you know, and mm. from that point of view, if you get that bit right and they see that and, you know, and you give them love and a good education, it's actually not that hard. Well said. At times. Mm. Yeah. No, uh, but I think we're a good team and we do, and it is about being a team and supporting one mm. another. And we, you know, we both going up and ups and downs and, um, but I think we're in it together and we help support each other a lot and I think have set that example you know for our kids and I think it's it's not unusual that Tracy would not know how to answer that question because sometimes your excellence is very hard to detect in yourself yes. you know and living with someone I call her the crumb looker which means that she sees the crumb and it's this constant desire to make it better including the crumbs left on the table like she can see that so but but for her that's just normal she's thinking well how do you not see it that's right. you know yeah. it's just so obvious so mark I, I i'm just gonna put this on you but you seem like an overachiever because of your bio so by nature as a little boy mm. were you like this were you always up to everything like that's my what was your dream for when you grew up i I always thought I was a little bit, um, 
always felt special, you know, whether that was because of my parents, the way they raised me or, and I felt like I deserved to be heard and I deserved to be there. And, and so from that point of view, um, I didn't mind a little bit of attention, you know, so I was quite, um, and, and then I just have always had this feeling where I was okay to open my mouth and, and give my opinion and, and potentially lead a little bit, you know, so that from that point of view, it's always just been part of me. I think I was just born that way. But um, did you want to go to, he wanted to go to the Olympics in equestrian. Yeah, so I, he used to ride right. horses. I rode up on, you know, on the outskirts of, I rode up. Yeah, I grew up. grew up on the outskirts of Brisbane riding, riding horses. And um, we lived on sort of semi-rural property and I went to the, you know, I was in the pony club and was eventing, one day eventing. And I wanted to, you know, go to the Spanish riding school and I wanted to be a vet and I wanted to go to the Olympics in the three-day event and I loved eventing and, but, you know, it was this six foot five gangly thing that was, um, I'm sure the, the horses, once they started to see the size of me, they all ran, ran away. They rejected but, you. <laughs> but, I, you know, I, I was, um, that was my big focus. And then how crazy is this? In grade 12, I didn't quite get the, the academic score that I needed to get into med science. So I started to do engineering and then I didn't, I wasn't passionate about that. And then I saw a movie called 16 Days of Glory. Oh, no, no. Um, sorry. Oh, Chariots, Chariots of Fire. Fire. Chariots oh, yeah, of Fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry, six, that was another movie. Another. Chariots of Fire, which then, if you know what that's about, it was about the 1924 Olympics in Paris. And, um, you know, all these uni guys at university and, and going, off to the, going off to the Olympics. So, and I was at that stage in my life, I'd, I'd actually... Um, it was never the best swimmer at school. It was one of those things when I was in senior, I, by virtue of two other guys leaving the, the year before me, I became the, the swimming captain by default. And so I just went down to the local pool and started swimming. And, you know, the coach down there said, listen, why don't you come and swim with us? And, you know, all of a sudden he said, you know, after about eight weeks, he said, you could swim for Australia one day. And I was like, what? I couldn't even, you know, I couldn't even get break 58 seconds for the 100 metres uh, freestyle, which is, you know... A, 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 a reasonable woman could do easily. So mm -hmm. from that point of view, um, I had no reason to believe it, but I just did. And physically I was, I was suited, you know, to it and, yep. um, you know, went from there. So I think growing up, I, um, I always wanted to be good. And my mother was always, you know, um, she'd always say, you know, just try the best you can, do your best. Do your best. You know, they always accepted failure. You know, that dust just, you know, that dust us off and off we'd go again. So, you know, both, and dad was quite calm with that sort of thing. He was, he was calm, but very um, uh, definite. And he was committed to all of us kids um, getting into sport. And he used sport as a way to teach us teamwork and discipline and life skills and all those sorts of things. So, you know, not realizing now i can just imagine how my father would have felt when i went to the olympics but you know as a 21 year old you go, oh, yeah whatever dad you know, mm -hmm. you know but now i sit back and think about how uh you know proud he would have been with the effort and the time that he put into all of us and um you know to have one that actually went all the way through so there, was, but, there were six of you right yeah yeah but look i think you know the, the real dominant force was my mother and she's very driven and mark was and she believed you could do anything and yeah. You know, and if you wanted to achieve it, you could. And, you know, for a woman back then, that was, um, that was pretty out there. Mm. And do you have a doubter voice? Because you had that strong presence in your life, a believer. Mm. I, say, I know that you're a believer, but do you have that doubter or it just doesn't even exist for you? No, well, when I was competing, it, you know, how lucky am I? By the time I'm 21, I had the, had the opportunity to actually understand all of those demons and to challenge them and take them on and probably you know Tracy was a bit different because she was just very talented and so you know just this sort of talent dripped off her she she was competitive but I've never felt that she's had to compete as hard as what I had to compete because just her, her natural more natural maybe yeah yeah and you know so from that point of view um yes I, I used to have a lot of those thoughts but as an athlete I learned how to you know control the voices you know and mm -hmm. take understand the negative voice mm -hmm. and listen to it 
and accept, accept it. and start to work on it and start to actually turn that around. And I think, you know, you can't block out the negative voice. You've got to, you've got to listen to it. You've got to acknowledge what it's telling you. And then you've got to work a plan to, to overcome it. And, right. you know, which and, is great thing about sport and what we've learned through sport. Like, and while you're in it, you don't really, I think, appreciate it until years later, you kind of look back and you realize how much you use the skills and things you learn through sport and from the ups and downs that you use in your everyday life. And so, you know, I'm forever grateful that, you know, we both had that background and that experience to be able to learn. Um, and that hopefully we can share with our kids as well. Yeah. So to answer your question, the doubting, I, I, don't, I, I, wouldn't it, say it doesn't, I don't, you I wouldn't don't know doubt it. because you, as soon as I see a, um, uh, a problem or obstacle. an obstacle, I will, con- get a contingency plan and work Mm. my way around it. Yeah, I had a a coach, a modern day coach say something like, acknowledge the feeling, but don't stop and take selfies. And I always, (laughs) isn't that clever? Yeah, Yeah. there you go, Juvan. I loved when he said that because it was so true. It's like, don't, you don't have to dwell, but you do acknowledgement has value in order to create a plan and do a plan that's right to deal with it and you know we try to teach our kids this sort of stuff which Mm -hmm. is so tracy you kind of alluded to it there but birthing and parenting five children um what skills transferred do you think you know even mark kind of acknowledged your excellence coming into how you wanted to mother the kids what do you think came in or can you identify what came in from your kind of background to help you be a mom? Well, first of all, I guess, you know, there's always so much um, focus on the birth, right? Mm. And and so I think as an athlete and being in tune with my body and being able to manage pain Mm. and stay relaxed and, you know, work with it. And um, that probably helped in the actual birth. But then you have this little person and you're like, oh, now what? Nobody talks about what next. And, Mm. And I guess Mark had older sisters who had had children, but I had never really been around babies and and little people when we had our own children. Not many of my friends had had kids yet. And, um, but I think um, being a part of a team, working together, talking, um, being on the same page and um, just being your best, doing your best, um, enjoying it. Um, laughing not worrying about the crumbs no <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. well I was actually I was gonna ask are you perfectionistic no yeah um, he's know. more yeah that's him I'm yeah. more relaxed mm-hmm. and um which I think again is very good and it, we complement to each other and sometimes I can say mm-hmm. you know we don't have you know let's just you know that old saying of you know treat people the way that you want to be treated mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, that's not true <laughs> well yeah, Does it always I, work? Because I am a perfectionist and okay. and that I have treated people the same way that I treat and myself. Very good. I get it. And and it doesn't go so well in some relationships that I've had. So I've mm-hmm. learned to just back off and let people be who they want to be. Yeah, okay. I get it. I get that analogy more. Um, yeah, I kind of experienced that after being a mom, actually, because in business I was very like stringent, like because I had a high standard of how I showed up when other people didn't do that. I just was like, you know, write that off. And, you know, and, and just whether it's baby brain or whatever it was, just some of the things that happen, I think I grew some compassion, as Nat would say. She doesn't always think I have a lot of that. But um, Tracy, you know, as your kids grow up and they have their own successes in life, do you find yourself ever shelving your own purpose for theirs? No, what, what do you mean by that? Like, well, and I said ever, because I imagine you don't do it often, but because your kids start having their own lives, their own things that they're up to, you know, we talked about driving them around to all their activities. Do you ever get lost in their lives Mm -hmm. and not really know, like, what am I doing? What's my direction? What am I, you know? I think most women probably do experience that a little bit. Um, I really loved it and it was a choice. Especially in their 50s. Yeah, it was a choice that I made, you know, when they're all younger and you're busy and it was fun and so much happening. And, and I, do, I did, I, I guess, 
as I got a little bit older, I'm kind of thinking, well, hang on, what about me? Like, there's been so much focus on this family. And I feel like sometimes, you know, I'm down the pecking order a little bit. What about me? Yeah, I, I think Tracy does feel yeah, that. Yeah, sometimes I feel it probably more now. Mm. Mm. And, and because as she says it, I go, what are you talking about? Everyone just adores you and loves you and you just, you know, you're so thankful of what you do. Yeah. And, and I think, yeah, she does lose herself a little bit. Because there. I think sometimes it is a thankless job and you don't always get, you know, in sport you get uh, reminders of how you're doing and feedback how you're doing and the coach is telling you and you're racing your competitors, you look at the clock, you know how you're doing. And sometimes as a parent, you know, or in a job, you kind of don't always get that kind of feedback, which I kind of missed you know, from sport. But um, again, I think we go on date night and we've probably been doing that for the last eight years. We've been able to do it regularly every Thursday night and just time for us. Because as you can imagine in a busy household, you can get lost a little bit. And you know, I, I, if someone would ask me, what's a success, you know, how do you have a successful marriage? Have date night. You know, it's, it's such a simple, every Thursday night, we're religious with each other about it. And so, you know, I've got, always got things on a Thursday night. I just say, no, nah, date night. Everyone knows it. My PA knows it. Awesome. And I look forward to it, you know, because I get Tracy. It's just calm. Sometimes we go to the movies mm -hmm. and, you know, she wants to have her own popcorn and I eat mine <laughs> and she won't let me eat hers. But, um, you know, or we'll go to dinner and we're always doing something on a Thursday night. And I think that has been uh, a real help to our relationship. I look forward to it and it keeps Tracy calm. And I think good call because having five kids, I mean, just having one, I saw how easy it was to have your gaze on your child mm -hmm. and you know you just rush around you can almost be in a house there's stats on this of how little time couples actually look each other in the eye yeah. Yeah. and so you know it's it sounds so simple but it's so easy to override it the date night and schedule something else in and so look mark i don't want to repeat myself but i do want to kind of drive this point home and ask you about being with a powerful woman like Tracy. You talked about having strong mother, strong female background, but what do you think allows you to stand next to her as a powerful man? I, I think off the top, the thing that comes to my head is, is we have very much, whilst we're a team, we actually have our own lives. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, Tracy, you know, she is my foundation. She, the family, what she provides allows me to do what I do professionally. Um, and, but I think whilst I think it's, you know, she's not living that life, you know, day by day with me. So it, when we come together, it allows us to, um, to be together. Hmm. I think, because she's not there every second, you mean? Well, I think there's the physical side of that, but also she lets me just get on and do what I need to do. And, um, and, and I, I think, think that's, that's why I, I find it so easy to stand next to her because she mm -hmm. spends a lot of, I'm sure, spends a lot of her time thinking about how she can help me mm -hmm. achieve and do yeah. what, I, what I need to do. So I think she's probably... I always felt with Tracy that, you know, even at a very young age, she had achieved so much and done everything that she'd wanted to do. And so she's always had a huge capacity to give. Um, so I think, you know, she allows me to stand next to her. Oh, it's well, and, and Mark is, is at the very beginning, how he said he's very comfortable in his own skin, wasn't threatened by me, mm -hmm. um, you know, was confident, is confident, um, you know, and it's it's a pleasure for me to stand next to him and, and right. we support each other. And I mean, and, the big thing is get your shit together, you know, like get your personal <laughs> shit together and then you've got something you to can. give someone else. You know, it, it's if you if you don't, if you're both sitting there going, oh, God, you know, how do I deal with life? And this is everything's playing me a, a bad hand. It's very hard to stand next to each other and just be, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I the most important thing for me is I think about my health and my mental health and my sleep and my exercise. And if I get those things right, I've got a huge capacity 
to love Tracy, love the kids, love, and, and then give, give to people. But if I don't have that foundation, I'm, I'd be useless. I have to sometimes say when I can tell he's a little bit cranky or stressed, I say, now go get your gills wet, go for a swim. Oh, you know, wow. And, and that is, he clears mm. his head and it's not mm. only exercise for his body, but his mind. And, you know, and so we try to make our, you know, the, those kind of things while well, I don't swim, um, but we try to make that health and exercise and time for yourself, um, you know, a, an important part. So then you are in a position to give, to your partner and to your family and to and your business. And you've got a, a certain calmness that I think you've got to um, learn that, that allows you to come together with each other as well, you know, because it's not always clean, you know, calm sailing. Yeah. Just when, when you when you get some headwinds, you've got to be able to just stay relaxed and feel good about things and know you're going to get through. And I think that's the other thing I truly know we're going to get through. It's never been in doubt, you know, so from that point of view, I guess we're lucky too. I really love your share because even how I positioned that question, I was like, you know, I did it because there's a stereotype in how I asked that question to Mark about Tracy, but it was so great to see her. You quickly kind of get that. Well, that's actually not really all that that's about. She also allows me to be who I am. And I love that you both clearly you get that. And at our wedding, we had um, the quote, or the saying or from a book called Marriage or On Marriage by Khalil Gibran. And it's, you know, really about the space yep. in between. And I really hear that poem, you know, coming from you both. Yeah, I recommend people look it up if they don't know it because it's really about, you know, the space between the notes yep. and just allowing each other. That's what I get from it. Why, you know, my definition of unconditional love is being able to say to somebody else, there's nothing that you need to be or do in order for me to be okay. And to me, Mark's translation was get your shit together, which was much more poetic than how I just said it. But, but ultimately, you're the demonstration. So I think it's important that we end with a typical board game at your house. And clearly, you can't play on the same teams. So you're playing against each other. Like, is there kind of this like repetitive way that it goes? Like, how does it go? Is it like, oh, Tracy, again, the silent assassin? Or is it like, tell me how it goes in your house? It's probably more interesting how our kids go, I find. But, um, <laughs> it, it depends. If we're with my mother and father, it usually ends up with my father getting the shits and walking oh, away. This. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. In my family, I'll, I'll out it with, we have people that there's a past of being kicked out of the home. It has happened. <laughs> so you could say it to, to me. I get this stuff. Yeah, yeah but no. Uh, um, like I'm always, it's interesting when we play games. Are, I'm always taking the risk. Yes. And okay. it pisses her off sometimes because she says, why would you know you're not going to win? Why would you do that? You know, and I'm going, well, I think I'm going to get you, you know, so. Yeah, he goes hard. He goes out hard and goes after yeah. it. And, and quite often that frustrates her because she sits there and says, you know, why would you take that risk? So, But sometimes but then me. I, you know, sneak in and, ah, gotcha. Well, that's, yeah, she, she loves <laughs> Well, that. see, I, there's a saying that says, as we do one thing, we do everything. And so um, I think a board game kind of just says it. I think you guys just described your lives like right there in a <laughs> nutshell. <laughs> Need we not say more? Okay. And I really want to say that because thank you so much, you two. It's just this little snapshot into the life of people that put value on relationship. Um, you've clearly been and continue to be super successful in your lives, but I think uh, it's clear to me what your foundation is, you know, and what matters the most to you both. And, you know, for Nat and myself, we've always been very inspired by you both, real mentorship in many areas. So thank you so much for coming and speaking to our audience because that's that's what we do we get people that mentor us and invite them to share with our people so thank you pleasure, pleasure. thanks sarah